So in order to understand photography, I think it's really important to take a look at the history because I think it's, uh, it's really interesting and it also gives you some perspective on why photography developed the way that it did. Now doing the research for this lesson, I realized it actually went back a little further than I had remembered. The first idea for a pinhole camera was kind of came up, came up with in the time of Plato. So in ancient Greece and in China around the same time, people were kind of imagining doing sort of sort of thought experiments th for something that would someday resemble what we'd use hundreds of years later, thousand years later, in the pinhole camera. Now the next step is the camera obscura. And the camera obscura is actually really interesting because it's basically a camera without film. The idea is you've got a wall, so you've got this empty room, and if you put a little tiny hole in the wall, the light will come in from the other side and it will be sort of focused through that hole and then onto the wall on the opposite side. So you can see here that this scene is being reflected on this wall, or sort of focused on this wall through this hole. And this is basically the foundation of photography right here. This is the moment when this came into focus, or, well, really, quite literally as well. The only thing that was really missing was the chemicals for this, and these were discovered somewhere between the 1200, year 1200 and 1600. The different scientists at different times realized that, realized that there was this sort of group of chemicals that were related to silver, and one was silver nitrate. And this turned out, in the end, to be uh, photosensitive. And this whole discovery of it being photosensitive was first sort of formulated and organized by a guy named Wilhelm Homburg in 18 or er, sorry in 1694. And this is when he realized that there was a as he put it a photochemical effect. Now the groundwork was basically laid for photography to begin. So from here from 17 eight, 1700 through the 1800s um, you see kind of a focus on lenses and on sort of bettering this camera obscura over here. So you'd have people putting in a lens right here instead of just a hole. And this would lead directly to the developments that would come in the 1800s. And that development came f roaring around the corner in 1826 in southern France. This guy right here, his name is Joseph and his last name is Nieps, oh, and I'm spelling it wrong. And Joseph Nieps was just kind of a guy who was interested in the entire idea of photography, and he wanted to develop some kind of camera. And he had taken a camera obscura, and he had worked around with these light-sensitive silver nitrates, and at the same time, he had been exchanging letters with this guy over here, Louis Dugard. Well, Char uh, Joseph Neves was the first person to really come up with a photo, a permanent photo, and that's a really important distinction because a lot of people had made photos, but it was this was the first permanent photograph. Lots of times they would make them and then they would soon deteriorate really quickly, but this was the first one that would last, and it lasted up until now. You can see here that you've got some buildings, got maybe a field back here, and if you look really closely, you can actually see that the sun moved so far during the day that it's actually exposed the walls on both sides. So the lighting of the photo is actually a little off. Now this was done on a piece of pewter with some, just with some silver nitrate slapped on it. And it took eight hours to make this photograph. So eight, can you just imagine taking a photo that takes eight hours to make? You can't move the camera a single bit, except to leave the camera there for eight hours. So this step now behind them, the move then became to simplify and and strengthen the power of photography and to make the photograph something that you could take instantaneously, things that so it wouldn't take eight hours to make a photograph. So when Nieps died, so Nieps died, Nieps, I'll say, died in 1833. And he passes all of his papers on to de Guerre. There was a man named Louis Jacques Mandé de Guerre in Paris who was experimenting with the idea of photography at the same time. 
and on the 7th of January 1839 it was published in the Paris press that uh, he had created a photographic process and that the images were little miracles in and of themselves. Uh, Talbot, meanwhile, he hadn't really made an image since 1836, and uh, he was probably sitting down to breakfast sometime about January 12th uh, when he uh, read the newspaper that the news had come through. Fox Talbot was now forced to go public. Barely three weeks after the announcement in Paris, a paper by him was read to the Royal Society. Some accounts of the art of photogenic drawing or the process of which natural objects may be made to delineate themselves without the aid of the artist's pencil, a method which I had devised some time previously. In the grounds at Laycock, photographer Richard Sinan Jones showed me what practical steps Fox Talbot then took to improve on his process. Here, Richard has taken an image of the Abbey using a replica of the bigger camera that Fox Talbot had ordered, equipped with better lenses. No f-stops on the lens. Thanks for reminding me. There we go. <laughs> f44. So that drops the exposure time it, down, does it? It does. It yeah. stops the light coming through, yeah, yeah. but then yeah. makes it much sharper as well. The larger format camera also allowed for a much larger final image than Talbot's first photographs. So what is this now, essentially? This is a, a negative? It's a piece of uh, ordinary paper um, treated with light-sensitive chemicals. It's uh, sandwiched between two, two oh, sheets yeah. of glass to keep it moist. Yeah. Basically a light-sealed cassette with a, a kind of slide at the front there yeah. that exposes the plate to the inside of the camera. So you've focused up already, you've done your aperture, Lens cap's on, aperture's in. Um, You've got a good idea, exposure time? Yeah, 20 minutes. Because of improvements to the chemical coating of the negative, exposure time shortened from hours to minutes. Here, Richard exposed the photographic plate for 20 minutes, and here is the result. And I think what Richard has produced is truly magical. The daguerreotype took the same process and basically made it something that could be done more quickly and more permanently. So instead of taking eight hours, it would just take a few minutes to make a photograph. And this is one of the first daguerreotypes. It's of a city, obviously, somewhere in southern France. And you can see here this guy with his foot up on a sort of pedestal. And this guy's actually getting his shoes shined. And there are lots of other people walking around on these streets, but this guy was the only person to stay still for the whole photograph, the whole time it was being made. And so he's the, ol he's the first photographed human in, well, that we know of at least. So very interesting, you know. Um, so this whole discovery and the release of this discovery really prompted a lot of activity. Now this guy over here, his name is Fox Talbot. Fox Talbot was a British guy, so across the channel, and he had been interested in the idea of photography, or it wasn't called photography yet, but in the idea of capturing images on, on silver nitrate plates, as they would say back then. And um, he, in this astronomer whose name was George, uh, sorry, John Herschel, uh, worked together on lots of different things, and in 1839, sort of through their collaboration, John Herschel came out with the glass negative. The glass negative was important because it was a, a better way of capturing the image and it was something that would become sort of a standard for some time, for almost really 60 years or something like that. So the glass negative is developed, get the name down, John Herschel quite a famous astronomer in his own right, as well as a developer of photography. And then just one year later, Talbot comes out with his own process, and it was called the calotype. It was a wet process that had some sort of paper negative. And the thing was, though, that Talbot then, and this was Talbot, we'll make sure we distinguish that. And the thing was that Talbot 
put a copyright on this. And that is the reason that really the daguerreotype took off, because the daguerreotype was bought by the French government and put immediately in the public domain. That meant that any photographer could use it. And so the daguerreotype basically within a couple months became the standard form of photography for at that time. And the calotype, because it would have been a little bit more expensive and money would have been going to, him, to, to Fox Talbot over here, it never became quite the hit that the daguerreotype did. In 1841, Fox Talbot painted the whole process, calling it the calotype, ancient Greek for beautiful picture. In the courtyard, he took photographs that showed a grasp of composition and framing. For example, the ladder. And this homage to Dutch painting, the open door, with its atmospheric use of light and shadow. And now there was a word for capturing images with a camera, first used by astronomer Sir John Herschel. Herschel called it photography, Greek for light drawing. Beyond Laycock, others took up the calotype process. In Scotland, painter David Octavius Hill and chemist Robert Adamson used it to produce portraits rather than images of buildings and nature. Like these wonderful photographs of New Haven fishermen who appear so confident in front of the camera. But Fox Talbot's technique had its limitations. It was unpredictable, with the positive prints from his negatives often muddy or grainy. One artist, struggling to make a living, was disappointed by the calotype. And by the 1850s, it was really common to see roving photographers like this traveling through the countryside of, of Europe and, and even in America and other places and um, doing these sort of mobile photo studios. And because the whole, I mean, these days you can do everything that they could do in this with a laptop and a camera and even a cell phone. But at the time, it took quite a lot. You had a lot of chemicals, you had to do a lot of mixing, you needed a dark room. So everything had to be brought with you in the wagon. But it's very quick. You could see here that prominent people, this is the the czar and his wife, and this is, um, this is Abe, Abe Lincoln, one of the early American presidents, all being photographed early on because they realized the power and, and were all very fascinated by the idea of photography. Now, during the 1860s, um, the American Civil War was photographed by this guy named Bradley, or, well, it was most likely photographed mostly by his assistants, and he sort of took credit for it. Um, and this was basically, this was kind of more the second incidence. The Armenian War was really the first incidence of photography being used in war and photographing war. So, kind of an interesting note in history. Now, early studios would have looked something like this. So pretty much any time from the 1840s onward, you would have had a big, huge camera. You can see that is a massive camera. And you've got this guy sitting here doing this very sort of stilted pose. And the reason for this is because you've got this piece here holding his head. And this was sort of a required piece of equipment for um, for photographers at the time because the speed of the camera was still so slow. Um, you would have had to hold that pose between two minutes and maybe if your photographer had a really fast camera maybe 30 seconds. So that's a really long time to hold your head very still for a photograph. So it's pretty amazing. You'll sometimes look in the photos and you'll see that people blinked during the photos or things like that. Um, but these machine, this piece of machinery here on the back, this sort of stand, is meant to secure the head and it's often hiding behind the person in the photo. You don't usually see it when you look at the actual photos. But this is how people adapted to the technology. As it progressed though, things got better and they didn't have to use that anymore. In a former Manchester cotton mill, photographer John Brewer demonstrated how Archer also used recent advances in chemistry to develop his own photographic process. Revealed in 1851, this was wet plate photography, 
Well, first of all, you need to cut the glass, and then it has to be immaculately clean. Instead of flimsy paper, Archer used the more solid medium of glass to make the negative plate. So you're coating this glass all over? That's right. Yeah. So it literally is a wet plate? It is, yeah. um, and if it dries out, you wouldn't be able to develop it. Not so everything to has to be done it. quite quickly from now on? It does, you know, We can't yeah. mess about. Archer introduced a newly discovered chemical solution being used in medical dressings, collodion. So what's in now? What's this box has just gone into? That's silver nitrate. So the silver nitrate is mixing with some of the chemicals in collodion to make it light sensitive. Because the plate is so light sensitive, this first stage of the process ends in the dark. The next stage takes place on the studio floor where I have my photograph taken. The prepared wet plate is exposed to record an image of my ugly mug. Okay, so I'm just checking the focus onto the eyes. How long do you have to take my picture? Really, just a couple of minutes. Wow. So we need to work really fast. So I'm going for an exposure here of 20 seconds. So I'll shut up now and not move, right? Now you can breathe. I can breathe. Oh, and you good. can blink. Oh, right. OK. So we use a top hat as a shutter. I love, I love your shutter covers. Brilliant. OK, three, two, one. Wet plate photography greatly speeded up exposure times. Within a decade, we'd gone from 20 minutes needed by Richard at Laycock to the 20 seconds it's taken John here. Well, that's painless. The last stage, back in the dark, is where the image finally appears. We've taken the photograph, we've beetled it back to the darkroom. What is that you're pouring on That's there? developer. Right. It's that moment of nervousness and anticipation I remember from my own darkroom days. That waiting for the photographic image magically to appear. OK, we put the light on. Wow, look at that. So that's how fast it is. Wow. It is Victorian Polaroid. Victorian Polaroid, great yeah. phrase. Wow, look at the quality of that. That's superb. Shame about the bloke in it, but it's a superb neg. From this one negative, you could print as many positive copies as you liked. A mass production of images so appropriate for a Britain experiencing industrial revolution. Evidence for a boom in commercial photography could be found on every high street, like here in Lewis, East Sussex, where Edward Reeves opened for business in 1855. For Reeves and others, the wet plate process had made photography a sound economic proposition. And as prices dropped, for the very first time in history, people of even a modest income could afford to own a portrait of themselves. To cope with the demand, Edward built a glass studio at the back of his shop. His great-great-grandson, Tom, still works here. With Tom, I found out what it was like to be photographed Victorian style. Of course, I was suitably dressed for the okay, occasion. Pleased to meet you, sir. Would you care to sit for your portrait? I will, sir. <laughs> Why the clamp? Well, in the very early days of photography, exposure times were probably between half a minute and a couple of minutes, which means that in order to get a sharp image, you would have to sit very, very still for that time. Is that why um, many men in the photographs look grumpy? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, apart from cultural 
considerations, you can't keep a muscular smile going for that sort of time. You should be able to feel the I can. clamp yeah. in the neck just it as a bit of a steady. It, it shouldn't be too bad. It's a well-to-do Victorian drawing room. The biggest aspidistra in the world. The, I mean, all the props are also there to aid stability, so you can rest your arm on the table, which gives you a little bit more of a brace for the right. long exposures. The image is focused on a ground glass screen at the back, right. so I go under the... So you're going under there to, fo to focus on me. That's right, yeah. that's right. Under the, under the dark cloth, I can then see you upside down on the ground glass screen. And... Photography was being assimilated into daily life with astonishing speed. Now, here is really where that step takes place, where things really got a lot faster and really changed a lot. 1870s, um, the dry plate comes out and becomes really popular. Instead of having wet plates of, of, of copper or things like that that you had to put inside of a camera or um, like a pewter plate or something like that, you would just have a dry piece of emulsion that was sort of like the film that you would be used to from, from but, but on, usually on like a hard plate, not on something that was soft. Now in the 1880s, Kodak really made some big steps in the technology and really kind of came out with some things that would really forever change photography. Um, in 1840 or in 1884, George Eastman develops a dry gel on paper and so basically sort of the predecessor to the film that we would be using 50 years later. Uh, in 1888 they came up with this slogan right here which I think is just great you press the button and we do the rest and they used to send cameras to their customers with a hundred photos in them and then the p person could run around and take photos of all they want to their heart's content and then send them into the Kodak factory which looked something like this get it developed and they would then come back as photos 1924 was important because Leica came out with the first 35 millimeter camera 35 millimeter camera really revolutionized photography in some pretty fundamental ways. And the reason is because before this, cameras were just so big and heavy, it was really hard to take them out and capture things um, in in the way that you would experience them. And so you can see here, for example, this image from D-Day in World War II. This is sort of the style of photography that the 35 millimeter allowed for. People could bring a camera with them and shoot something running uh, running along with the action and the camera was so light and small that you didn't have to even have a tripod and it was fast enough that you could you could really take a lot of new innovative photos uh, after World War II things really changed a lot and this is where things really kind of blasted out of the gate um, the first SLR came in 1949 so this is a single lens reflex and we'll explain what that means later but this is a very special kind of camera that really kind of has become the industry standard for for professional photographers also um, the first digital image so this is actually a scanned image so it's not from a digital camera but it is um, the first di digital image right there so from that moment on, photography really made a lot of leaps and bounds very quickly. In 1963, you get the Polaroid camera. In 1985, you got autofocus, which really changed the way cameras worked with, with consumers and really changed the kinds of cameras that consumers were buying. From there, you then move into the 90s, and it was definitely the beginning of the digital age. You can see this NASA experiment up here. This was a press camera that was being experimented with. You can see it's like carrying a massive computer around. And then there were some early attempts at consumer cameras as well. And that brings us to now. That brings us to the almost now. In 2004, Kodak stopped making uh, film cameras, so they started switching over to digital cameras like this one right here. Cameras got to be a lot bigger, a lot, took a lot of different directions. You can see here um, the mirrorless uh, sort of wave of cameras that came in 2011. And uh, the DSLRs also got very big, very expensive, and started making video.